Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. I'm Terry Osborne, Interim Regional Chancellor of USF Sarasota Manatee, and I have the pleasure tonight of introducing to you Dr. Phil Wagner. Um, Dr. Wagner is an uh, uh, instructor in our College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences who is coordinating our general education work, our core curriculum work, and is also chair of our diversity committee and has led us in making some wonderful changes and additions to our campus. Um, those of you who know Phil will appreciate my tongue-in-cheek remark when I tell you that Phil is single-handedly making America great again. <laughs> Not America, but hopefully USFSM. That's our goal, that's our goal. A big thank you to Dr. Terry Osborne, uh, who serves in our interim regional chancellor spot and has been very gracious and supportive of all the diversity initiatives that the Diversity Council has done. Um, I'm up here just to give a few really brief remarks. I'm a communication person and I can belabor all day, so I've limited myself to three quarters of a page. Give me just a second. I have to give a few thank yous and then just a few housekeeping items as well. Um, I've gotta give thanks to the Chancellor's Diversity Council. Um, I chair those efforts, but I am certainly not alone. The council's a 22 person large uh, force for change on this campus and has been wonderfully supportive um, and so we're really excited to come together and sponsor this event this evening I'd also give a shout out to the Multicultural Affairs Committee who has sponsored some food for us very generously so please hang around after the talk to get some nibbles um, but before we nourish our hunger I know there's gonna be some good food for thought tonight and I'm really honored to be up here introducing Dr. Charles Davis um, about a year ago when the Chancellor's Diversity Council first convened we knew that we wanted to have a space for some tough conversations. Uh, part of being in diversity and inclusion work is not always hugging it out and talking about unity. It is really exposing blind spots, talking about weaknesses and areas for growth. And USFSM is a community grounded institution. And so our successes are community successes. And often our blind spots are some of the very blind spots that our communities have as well. So we wanted to hold a forum like this where we can bring in not just members of our university, but people from outside, from local Sarasota to Manatee uh, places to come together and have these conversations together. So tonight, I'm really honored that we are joined with Dr. Charles H.F. Davis, and I'm going to give you just a brief background um, to him and what he does. So tonight's speaker, Dr. Charles H.F. Davis III, is a prolific and engaged scholar of race and education. In just the short amount of time that I've spent with him, I've been very challenged in even my own views. He's a wonderful guy, and he's nice, which I like as well. Um, he spends his life doing just what we outlined above, having tough conversations, especially about the role of race and equity in education. So a perfect conversation to have at a place like this. Dr. Davis received his bachelor's and master's degrees just up the road at Florida State University and his PhD in higher education at the University of Arizona. Dr. Davis currently serves as the Director of Higher Education Research and Initiatives at the University of Pennsylvania Center for, Stud Center for the Study of Race and Equity in Education. The center will be moving to California in the fall, so very exciting there and for him. Dr. Davis has worked extensively in race and equity, um, and his work has been published widely in many national mainstream and research outlets such as the Chronicle of Higher Education, Ed Week, Inside Higher Ed, Academe, Change Magazine, Color Lines, and many, many more. So uh, as I prepared to read his extensive biography, he let me know that he is just a normal person doing normal stuff like the rest of us. So rather than tell you all about his work, I'm gonna open up the floor for him to do just that. So will you help me in giving him a giant round of applause and welcoming to our campus. Great. Thanks so much. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. There we go, there we go. Uh, well, I'd like to uh, first thank you all for being here. I'm sure that there are a number of more relaxing things that you could be doing here in Sarasota. Uh, so I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to spend some time together and also with me to engage in this conversation. Uh, I'd also like to thank Dr. Wagner, um, as well as the committee on which he and others work, uh, who thought it not robbery to bring me here to be discussing these very important and timely topics as it relates to race and equity in higher education. Um, my experience in this uh, is both short and long in, in many different ways. Um, in the shorter version, I've been at the Center for the Study of Race and Equity for uh, three years formally in this particular position, but uh, for the last five years since the Center was founded uh, five years ago. Um, and in that time, I've been doing a lot of different 
types of things, some of which involve trainings and professional development, but also really studying and getting to understand some of the really important climate-related issues on college campuses throughout the country. Uh, but in long form, I've been black all my life, right? <laughs> Surprise. Um, and so in that, I've experienced and tried to understand what it means to be black in an educational system that fundamentally has not valued who it is that I am, where it is that I come from, and the perspectives and contributions of people that look like me and look like others. And so in that way, this has been a lifelong journey. Uh, in some ways, it is coming to a culmination of being back in the great state of Florida. Uh, as uh, Phil mentioned, I went to Florida State University. I don't know if there are any other Florida State folks here, no? Any UF folks? Do have to watch out for, okay. I mean, we, we won the last several games, so I think that that puts us in a good position. Uh, but nevertheless, again, I'm very happy that we're here today, and uh, I just want to talk about some sort of grounding uh, before we begin our conversation. So I think it's really important when we're engaged in these types of talks that we build a, what I call a container for the conversation. Uh, so often we get into these conversations, right, and they really quickly escalate. And partly we have not built a container within which to hold a conversation of this magnitude. And so in thinking about that and the work that we do, we think about uh, what starts what we call the four agreements. And this is emergent of uh, some work that happened in the K-12 space. But how do you engage in a courageous conversation? And some of these agreements include being willing to speak our truth. So as we get into the question and answer portion later, it's going to be really important that we uh, honor our true stories, that we represent truly our voices and opinions, that we're not uh, unwilling to share those because truth is where we have the opportunity to learn from one another, right? We can't be untruthful about the things that we know, the things that we've experienced in order for us to move forward. So I'm going to challenge you all to be speaking your truth. I can ensure that today I'm going to be speaking mine. As we're moving past this idea of speaking our truth, I'm also going to ask that we stay engaged. And what does it mean to stay engaged morally? What does it mean to stay engaged mentally, physically, emotionally in today's conversation? I'm also going to ask that, um, how should I say this, that we expect and accept non-closure, right? Um, this stuff has been going on for a really long time. Today is not going to solve all of that. We're not going to be able to get through everything in one particular conversation. Uh, but hopefully, um, as Phil's mentioned, this being one of the first of a series of things that will happen here, this will be a point at which we can start so that this conversation can continue after today. And then the last thing that I'll ask is that we lean into discomfort. Right? As an educator, and as many of you in the room, uh, I'm sure that you're aware, uh, education and learning can only happen in spaces of discomfort. And so I'm asking that we lean into the discomfort, right? the uncomfort that's going to happen perhaps in some of the conversations today. Um, and that we understand that discomfort and feeling unsafe are fundamentally different, right? I'm pretty sure that we're in a safe space for the most part, right? Um, here on this college campus, everyone seems to be you know, ready and attentive and polite and beautifully well-dressed. So everybody's here in a more or less comfortable environment, but it may get sometimes uncomfortable with some of the ideas that are brought up, with some of the stories that are going to be shared. But I'm asking that we lean into that so we have an opportunity for ourselves to learn. So do we think that we can do that? Yes. Do we think we can do that? Yes. All right. So again, as I mentioned, um, part of what we're going to be talking about today uh, really is going to be this idea of imagination and the role imagination plays in conceptualizing a future different than the present in which we currently live. And in thinking about that, what does it mean for our pathways towards freedom and liberation? Now, most of my own personal work focuses on activism and social movements in higher education. As I'm sure you are aware, this is a very popular thing that's been going on for the last several years. Um, I've been studying this particular topic for the last five years. I began this work in 2012 with an organization you may be familiar with called the Dream Defenders. Uh, the Dream Defenders is a coalition of black and brown youth here in the state of Florida uh, that originally uh, became a part of what it was uh, in the wake of Trayvon Martin's murder. Okay, in February of 2012, as we know, Trayvon Martin was murdered. I mean, the courts did not say so, but I will say so here publicly and unapologetically, that Trayvon Martin was murdered in a gated community in Sanford, Florida. And so a number of alumni of Florida institutions, as well as current students, assembled and organized to rally. Right? They rallied because, as we know, George Zimmerman was left uh, free for a period of six weeks and went without being arrested. And so they rallied and pulled themselves together, organized a 40-mile uh, march that took them three days from Daytona Beach to Sanford, Florida, where they later occupied the Sanford Police Station, shut that down, and were able to get charges issued from the state formally. And so since that time, I've been engaged in the work with the Dream Defenders. Uh, many of them are friends of mine. We organized together in the wake of what you may remember uh, as the death of Martin Lee Anderson. Martin Lee Anderson was a 13-year-old boy, black boy killed in a Pensacola boot camp in 2006. Um, and in the wake of that, we as students at that particular time in Tallahassee and, and other areas uh, worked together to try to think about what we could do to make sure that this uh, issue, one, got national elevation, but two, that the state took appropriate actions that we felt would be necessary. 
Um, and so in thinking about that, much of my work is couched in that conversation. It's couched in uh, the freedom and liberation for black people, but also all oppressed peoples uh, throughout the country. So my conversation will be, again, thinking about that um, throughout the conversation today. So as we want to be talking about this idea, right, the foundations, uh, the racist foundations, rather, of higher education, there's a couple of things that we have to kind of start with. And I think this is particularly interesting in the state of Florida, as it is in a number of places uh, throughout the country. So what I mean by this is first that we have to recognize that in the beginning there was settler colonialism and genocide. And so what do I mean by that? That this very land that we're on right now, the land where my alma mater is, the land where many of our institutions are, were occupied by people that were not us, right? That they were occupied by the indigenous peoples of this country, and in order for these institutions to eventually be where it is that they are, those people were removed in a number of different ways, right? The picture that's in the background here is from 1875 at Fort St. Augustine of native um, and indigenous prisoners. Okay, and we know that here in the state of Florida, again, we can think about uh, the Appalachian, right? We can think about the, uh, excuse me, the Seminoles. We can think about the Miccosukee. There are so many various tribes that we can think about in this state, and some of which we've attempted to even pay homage to with the mascots of our universities, right? The irony. And so when we think about, again, the beginnings of this, we have to recognize that this all started with the settler colonial project, that it was about the removal of these people in a violent way, right? And not something that was just through uh, the actual murder of those individual bodies, but also the cultural genocide that took place, right? The idea that those people weren't good enough as they were and had to be reformatted into a way that white supremacy, as I will name, thought it needed to be, that they had to look more images, in, in images that were more European, right, in order for them to fit the settler colonial project. So we have to understand that everything about higher education at its beginning starts with the project that was settling and colonizing America. And of course, we didn't stop there. We know that, right? So that my ancestors came here as slaves, right? They were brought here as slaves. And in that way, the institutions at which we work and the institutions uh, that we attend are also part of that same foundation. And so I'll give a couple of examples. So first, we have Thomas Green Clemson. Uh, the person after which Clemson University is named after. Now, Thomas Green Clemson is a native Philadelphian. He's an engineering by trade, but married uh, John C. Calhoun's daughter, and upon John C. Calhoun's death, was bequeathed uh, the Fort Hill Plantation. And so then he began running that plantation, was very much invested in the cotton production that was happening on that plantation, and upon his death, he gave all of what he had in terms of his fortune and his land to the state of South Carolina. And the condition was that you must build an institution with his name that would be then led to help train and develop the men in that particular state. And so we think about, again, what's necessary in order for these places to exist. Now, not only was that part of the conversation then, but the fact that Clemson University itself was built on the backs of prison and slave labor. There were black children as young as 12 years old building bricks that would later become the main central part of this campus um, at Clemson University. And so again, what does it mean to think about the racist legacies of our institutions when they were fundamentally built on land that was toiled by black people, right? The bricks that were actually led to building, uh, the buildings and the edifices that are on those campuses were by prison labor. How many of you are familiar with uh, the 13th documentary that's come out? I know we have Netflix people. If you don't have a password, I can give you mine. <laughs> okay. And so we know that part of chattel slavery converted into this mass incarceration that started very early on, right? And so 500 and I believe, 29 African Americans were primarily responsible for the labor that later built Clemson University between 1899 and I think 1909. And so you may say, okay, well that was like a long time ago, so maybe we can move a little bit past that. Maybe it was just the South, right? Sometimes the South gets a bad rap. I'm a Southerner, I understand. I think the grits are obviously better here. Um, Right, but it's not something that just happened here. It's something that happened in a lot of other places and people that are even more well-known than Thomas Green Clemson. So, who am I talking about? You familiar with this person? Yeah, Woodrow Wilson, right, 28th president of the United States, but also the former president at Princeton University. Princeton University is right across the road. I've done a number of different things there uh, with my colleagues. And as you may remember, the students at Princeton University uh, you know, sort of took up a side and said that we want to have this person's name and legacy uh, either properly contextualized but also removed from what is the Woodrow Wilson Public Policy School. And so the interesting thing about Woodrow Wilson, of course, we have sort of nostalgia wrapped in amnesia, as, as Michael Eric Dyson would say. 
right, um, is that we don't necessarily think about the legacy that that person has and what it means to have that represented on its campus. And so when we think about the legacy of Woodrow Wilson beyond being the 28th president, we have to think about what it meant to be president at that particular time. We have to think about what it meant for him and his trajectory that started at the university, uh, who was a faculty member there initially, uh, was a historian of sorts, and then later to become the president. Uh, what it is that he did there and what he had, did, uh, what he had done rather, excuse me, uh, during his presidency. So Woodrow Wilson uh, is credit, credited with the resegregation of a number of federal agencies after Reconstruction. Now, even for his particular time, this was something that was considered rather radical. The presidents before him thought it more meaningful to integrate African Americans into uh, leadership, into supervisory roles, right? Even Abraham Lincoln had Frederick Douglass, right? Uh, but not so much for Woodrow Wilson. Uh, even more so in his historical writings, right, there's a constant and consistent demonization of African Americans, but even more so a praise of the Ku Klux Klan. And we're familiar with the Klan, right? I mean, we're in Florida, I think we have to be, right? Originated in Indiana, obviously has been present here for a very long time. And so much so that his writings about the Klan were valorized in the historic, terrible film known as anybody? Birth of a Nation. And so when we're thinking about, again, these legacies, right? These histories, that there are folks like a Thomas Green Clemson, a Woodrow Wilson, right? who are almost immortalized in these spaces on our campuses. So what does that mean for the constant reminder of these people and their legacies as we see them daily in our lives as students on campus? And to sort of bring it home, right? So when we're thinking about John Wayne Reitz, University of Florida president, 1955-1967. Uh, a very well-known person that was against the integration of the university, um, had denied admission to as many as 85 African-American applicants, one of which would later protest that to the Supreme Court in 1964 to gain their admission, um, and also had made some uh, disparaging remarks that were very much homophobic. But the, at, at least at one point, I'm not sure if this actually turned over, but uh, the student union was named after him as a former president at University of Florida. And so the organization that I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, the Dream Defenders, the local chapter there in Gainesville, uh, thought that they needed to say something about that. And so they went to the Student Government Association, occupied that space, and said that we want this name to be changed. And not just changed in general, that we wanted this name to be changed in recognition of the first African American that was admitted here, somebody who fought for their own freedom and liberation and right to an education. But again, this is a sort of that trajectory, right, of thinking about how these particular individuals, all of whom are white, but also all of whom are men, I don't want to miss the gendered component that's happening here as well, right? That we see how this stuff happens over a period of time, but ultimately how the vestiges of those things are represented in very symbolic and personal ways. Names on buildings, statues in the middle of campus, right? Paintings in various halls and libraries, right? Now I know this is a, a regular, rather small campus, but at almost every campus I go to, I look for the old white man room. And inevitably, before I even really try to find it, I walk into it. And you all know what I'm talking about, right? It's like this hall, and there's like all these beautiful paintings with gold leaf rims, and there's you know, these different figures that are all former presidents or deans or something like that, right? And we've sort of contemporized this where we have pictures um, in, in places that are on frames. But we see this, right? And we see that these are reminders, and these are not reflections of even the complex, uh, diverse nature of our campuses as we see them now, right? But we're so committed and invested in those things. And so I wanted to start here so we have a bit of a historical understanding of how these things have played themselves out, but continue to play themselves out uh, over time. As you may know, again, with the Woodrow Wilson School, uh, they, Princeton decided not to take the name off. Uh, they thought that it'd be better to use it as a learning opportunity uh, to teach students. Now, whether that's going to actually happen, I'm not sure. Um, but I've actually done some work with the policy school and it came up. Um, and so it's interesting, again, how we sort of continue to invest and reinvest in these legacies without truly being honest about what they were and not being willing to depart with them because of what they mean to our institutions. So what does that say to someone like myself? What does it say to other people of color? Right? What does it say to even women on those campuses as well? Right? That their narratives are very much erased and not a part of that conversation. So now I want to talk about a case study uh, of racism in urban higher education. So as I mentioned, much of our work at the center and the, the work that I direct is around what we call campus climate assessment. So essentially, we are wanting to understand what the climate is like for students and professionals in the places in which they learn and work. Do they feel like they're having opportunities to interact across difference, right? Racial difference, gender difference, religious differences? Are they having opportunities to see themselves in the things that they are learning, right? That the voices that are represented in the things that are being assigned in readings, maybe the films that they're being assigned to watch, 
reflect the diversity of the voices that are in that classroom and the diversity of the students that are present. Right? We also want to know whether students are experiencing, and faculty and staff as well, uh, harassment discrimination. Right? And we know that that's something that's been happening for a very long time. Now, what we do have regularly right, are offices of equal opportunity or some sort of uh, compliance-based office that deals with things in HR, but often we don't have these things for students. We've started to see a manifestation of diversity offices or a chief diversity person or task force and committees that are starting to uh, look at these things. And so they bring us in to get a real formal assessment of people's lived experiences. And so we come in and we do dozens of focus groups. We talk to anywhere between two and 300 people uh, during our th three or four days on campus. Um, and then we take those learnings and we distill them into themes and we present those back to administration. Now I'm gonna give you one guess about what the administration often does with these, this information. Yes, all of those, all of those, right? So then nothing often happens. Um, and so part of that means that we have to figure out ways to become uh, more accountable in, in this particular work. One of those ways uh, as academicians is publishing something. And so what I'm gonna be talking about today is a case study um, that in many ways is of one particular institution, but also very reflective of all the institutions that we do this work at. No matter where we go, we find some of the same things happening all across the country, whether it's in an urban city in the Northeast, somewhere in the Midwest, or even here in the South. So I wanna begin with a little bit of, how do I say, class time? If we can, get a little theoretical. Um, so in this conversation uh, about this urban institution, we build our analytical framework, right, the way that we're making sense of what it is that we learned uh, using critical race theory. Is this familiar with it to anyone, critical race theory? Show of hands, a few. Okay. So uh, critical race theory emerged out of what was critical legal studies. And so a number of legal scholars uh, included were Kimberly Crenshaw, who you may be familiar with, uh, Derek Bell, uh, who was a former professor at Harvard University and passed away. Um, they came up with uh, sort of this formula as a way to understand the law, right? And when we think about the law, most of it is interpreted as a subjective thing, right? And now we know that that's not the case. When we look at the representations of people of color, of uh, working class and poor folks within the criminal justice system, we know that the law itself and codified within it are certain systems of oppression. And so with that, they said, we want to take an analytical look at the law, really putting race forward, right? Not saying it's an objective document, but saying that race is central into how it is that we're going to analyze this. And so these are sort of the six general tenets of how critical race theory uh, works. Now, academics and intellectuals might debate whether it's theory. We don't have time for that. We're not gonna get into that conversation today. We can have a sidebar at a conference over drinks and talk about that. Um, so the first one in identifying these things is one that C CRT recognizes that racism is endemic to American life, right? That it's something that is very much pervasive. It's in everything that we do. It's in everything that we see, right? Ads that are on television. Right, we're all familiar with the recent ad that Pepsi put out. <laughs> right, that was only one-upped by United Airlines' recent spoof. <laughs> right, but those things aren't racialized at all. Right, but of course they are. We know that it's endemic, right? We know that we see these things in our message, these things about sort of negative images that stereotype and portray certain people certain ways. And so we're saying here that this is endemic. This is something that is very prevalent in our society, not something that is sort of an anomaly that happens in one-off cases, although those are often explanations when things happen. Secondly, that CRT expresses skepticism toward dominant claims of neutrality, of colorblindness, objectivity, and meritocracy. And so we say that these things are not absent of thinking about and considering race. Right, when we think about the measures by which we evaluate students, right, when we think about the measures that were used to evaluate students at the University of Florida for admission, right, that those in and of themselves had racial components. Right? Now, whether we think that those criteria are just about merit or not, we have to think about who has access to merit. Right? And so part of that is about a racialized conversation. Third, that CRT challenges ahistoricism and insists on a contextual and historical analysis of structures. So part of at the beginning of this, right, is that we don't have an ahistoric perspective, that we're not without understanding properly the role that history has played in the manifestations of racism in higher education, right? Because many people will excuse and dismiss those things as if they're not true, or what we call like revisionist history, right? We like misremember. Uh, we have, you know, Sean Spicer misremembering a lot of stuff as of late, yes. right? And so this is an ahistoric perspective, right? It's also lying. We can just call it that too. But it's ahistorical, right, to suggest that what happened during the Holocaust didn't involve chemical weapons, even though it's been well completely documented, right? It's a historic to call people who were part of chattel slavery, who were violently taken from their nations and brought to this country and forced to work as some sort of indentured servants or like interns, 
right? And voluntary immigrants is a popular one, right? That's ahistoric. And so we're challenging ahistoricism in that. The fourth, we want to insist on recognizing the experiential knowledge of people of color. And so what does that mean? That means given that we understand that those narratives, right, that those contributions, those perspectives have not been included in what it is that we know about the world and the way that it works and the things that we study, that we want to center those in this conversation, right? That if we're going to talk about what it means to be a racialized person in this conversation, we might actually ask some people of color, right? We might not actually say as a white person, hey, Rachel Dolezal, how about you and I get together and talk about what it means to like, be transracial and not involve any people of color? No, we might actually center some people of color in talking about what it means to and what it can mean to be a person of color. Right? And so we want to center that because we know that it is not part of the contemporary conversation. Fifth is uh, that CRT is uh, interdisciplinary. And so simply that means that a lot of people from a variety of disciplines and fields of study come together so that CRT can work and be understood in education, in public health, in criminology and criminal justice, in the sciences, and that it relies on that interdisciplinarity. And then six, it, worked toward, it works toward the end of eliminating racial oppression as a part of a broader goal of ending all forms of oppression. Right? And so it's not simply saying that uh, race by itself is something that we're concerned about. Right? And if you know anything about Kimberly Crenshaw's work, is that she is uh, very much part of founding and coining the term of intersectionality. This idea that systems of oppression themselves are interlocking, overlapping, and intersecting, and those who have a number of multiple marginalized identities have unique experiences as a result of those cleavages. Okay? So it's interdisciplinary and it's intersectional. So now that we have an understanding basically of what this framework is, there'll be a test at the end. We'll see how you do. We're going to go into uh, the paper that we ended up writing based on some of the information that we had uh, from some of this climate work. Um, and so as you can see uh, in this paper, it was published in the uh, Urban Education Journal. And so I'm just going to go through the key findings. I won't belabor you with like, the literature and all this other stuff they make us write so we can get accepted and pass their standards. Uh, but some of our key findings. So I'll set some just general context. Um, so we call this university Cityville. And Cityville is lo uh, located in a large, uh, predominantly black city in the Midwest. Um, and so for us, it was very interesting to see the disparities that we saw. Um, in particular, we were looking for racial disparities. Um, in thinking of that, here are some of the key things that we found. So 10% of all undergraduates are black. This is in a city that's 35, 40% black, right? Only 10%. Um, and this is a smaller institution, so it caters particularly much like the institution here to the local community and wanting to recruit students from that local community. And what we found is that there's also a 75 to 100% of the black students uh, who were enrolled were all from local urban high schools. And this is across uh, a three-year trend. And this data was provided to us by the institution. We didn't have to necessarily look for it. We asked them for it, and they provided it to us, and we analyzed it uh, in a way that they probably didn't think that we were going to. Uh, because again, numbers speak for themselves, right? There's nothing racial about this. Um, and so we noticed that, and so we said, hmm. So not only do we have an underrepresentation in terms of enrollment, but all of the black students come from the same place. Even though there's like a bunch of places where we could get underrepresented minority students in this particular space. We also noticed that 69% of them were first generation college students, which isn't a bad thing, right? We want to make sure that first generation college students are having access and opportunities uh, to go to college as much as anyone else. But then we also noticed that 99% of those students were Pell eligible. And so this is similarly a, a codification of what it means to be represented from low income or working class families, right? Similar to free and reduced lunch in the K-12 system. And so we noticed this, that many of them were first generation, but most of them, right, uh, had qualified for the Pell Grant, which is something that the federal government just gives you upward up to $5,000 for you to uh, pay for your education and is usually the equivalent of what it would cost to attend a two-year college to ensure that all of those expenses are generally paid for. Of course, there's other costs associated with attending school. So we noticed those things. Then what we also noticed is this thing that we uh, refer to as institutional and first-year maladjustment. Um, and so what that means, right, is this idea of how students are doing within their first year that might indicate the extent to which they're able to persist to the following year. So in thinking about that, that there was only a 43% persistence rate uh, after the first year across these three years, so the entering class of fall 10, fall 11, and fall 12. But more importantly, there was an annual decline in first semester GPAs from 2.09, this is first time in college, first semester GPA, to 1.71. So this means each entering class over this three-year trend was actually getting worse. Okay. Some other key findings. Academic underperformance. 15.4% of the fall 2003 cohort 
uh, graduated within 10 years. Now, generally speaking, right, we're on, you know, a four-year idea of what it means to graduate. We've expanded that to six years, right, uh, especially as who is coming to college is different. We have a lot of non-traditional and returning students. Uh, we have students that are working part-time that also may need some extra time. But this is now in a 10-year trend. Over a period of 10 years, only 15.4% of those that were admitted in 2003 were actually graduated. Only 7.6% in the fall of 2007 cohort graduated within six years. Are we seeing where this is going? Yeah. Next, we talked about racialized experiences in the classroom and out-of-class experiences. Now, this is, again, something that I refer to in the work that we're doing, of wanting to understand what these lived experiences are of those that are attending these institutions. Now, part of this was based on uh, geographical segregation. Now, I'm going to talk about this in the analytical portion, uh, but we realized, again, that all of the students that they were recruiting all were from the same particular area. But not only that, one of the interesting things about this particular institution uh, is that it had a main campus. That main campus was located in the north part of the city. These particular students were not in the north part of the city. They were in the west part of the city. And so part of what was attempted to be a solution was that, oh, well, we'll put sort of a satellite campus, right, in this west part of the city. Sounds like a good idea, right? Um, well, not so much. And so this satellite campus, which was very much uh, like this, it was one building, significantly smaller. Uh, it was one building in the west part of campus, and in that particular building, you could only have one major. So this is the closest building that represents this uh, particular institution in this one part of town, and there's only one major to choose from, and it's urban affairs. And so as we were thinking about this, you know, part of our questioning was, you know, well, why is this and how did this come to be? And so when we talked to students, many of them, right, as we're thinking about that, those numbers, the financial numbers, the intersections of class and race, that it would take these students between 90 minutes and two hours to get to main campus. Now, I don't know about you all. I mean, I am moving to, like, Los Angeles, so I have to get used to this, I guess. But that would be one hell of a deterrent from getting to class. There's also a city in the Midwest. You can imagine what the snow is like and inclement weather of trying to navigate that without having a vehicle, right? And also the perception within that community. Many members in that community thought that the entire university was this one building. They weren't necessarily people who were enrolled, but they thought that the entire university was this one building that was on the west side. They didn't even know that there was a main campus. And so again, we're getting into the analytical portion of how much even more significant that is in a second. Students also dealt with a number of different forms of uh, stereotyping, right? Um, and this is common, right? We see this a lot of other places that often uh, faculty, you know, assume certain things based on the students and the bodies that they show up in, right? We also assume something about their ability to learn, their capacity for, the, you know, displaying some forms of genius. Um, and so in many ways, students were experiencing stereotyping, uh, and that would affect uh, their grades. That would affect how people taught to them. That would affect how people singled them out in front of their peers and made a spectacle of them based on these racist stereotypical assumptions. Next, microaggressions and micro-invalidations. Have we heard of microaggressions before? Yeah? Right, so often like these small, seemingly insignificant things that happen, things that you know, people of color and women uh, and members of the LGBTQ community often have to question because of the systems in which we live, right, are happening uh, regularly and ultimately have a cumulative effect, right? And so this could be so much as uh, you know, asking, well, what do black people think about Barack Obama? Because of course, he has to be the sole entire representative for all black people, right? In a conversation about race and politics in a political science class, right? That those forms of things are actually violent and people experience them as violent. So much so that now I have to withdraw as a student that I don't participate in this class because I'm being made a representative of my entire group. So then what, my participation grade goes down, right? So microaggressions, also microinvalidations. Right? I'll sort of go back into my own story of thinking about this as something across a longer educational journey. Right? When I was maybe seven or eight years old, I was in a class, and we were talking about world history, and they're putting all these pictures up. And you know, I'm raising my hand because I'm the you know, really energetic kid, and I you know, want to contribute and participate. And I'm saying, oh yeah, I went there, you know, this and that, whatever. Oh yeah, I went there too, da 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 da. And of course the teacher says, you haven't been anywhere. Stop talking. Right? because black kids don't travel. Of course, they didn't know, they didn't think about what my lived experience was as the son of an army colonel, that we spent three years of our lives living in Germany and he thought it would be a great idea to take us to Rome 
right, and take us to London and take us to all these different places so that I could experience and see things that he only dreamt about when he was a child. But that I was immediately invalidated, right, that my forms of knowledge in that particular moment were invalidated. I had nothing to contribute because what could this little black boy know about the Eiffel Tower? And so we see these same things happening in college classrooms on a regular basis, especially now, right, when we see that certain things that are in popular conversation emerge into classroom discussions, and that when certain people, particularly those people of color, have contributions about their own lived experiences that are testaments to the things that we're discussing, that we invalidate those experiences. And so students here were experiencing that as well. So the last point I have was about curricular disregard and disposability. That kind of goes back to my earlier point of not seeing oneself in the curriculum, not seeing yourself in the things that are being taught, right? Um, and so again, students experience that as well. So going into the sort of analytical part of Cityville, here were some basic notes that we had. So one, that there was a long-standing pattern, uh, historically, of residential racism and segregation. So we saw this with neighborhood redlining, which was a common practice uh, in the early part of the uh, 20th century that there were protective housing and tax policies that disenfranchised black families from owning houses in other parts of the city, um, and that also white-only mortgage breaks and subsidies were provided so that parts of the city could be arranged and settled accordingly. So then you see not only does the university become complicit in the reproduction of this same sort of injustice, but that it has a historical context. But at what point did any of the statisticians and other folks that were leaders at this university think about that in the way that they decided to move the university forward? Right? Did they analyze and think about student achievement in a decontextualized way? Right? And, our, and our argument is that yes, they did. Second, that black students, white logic, and whiteness is property. So this is going to get a little bit heady. But essentially what I was just talking about, right? that we had a frame that was suggested to be objective, but based on who was asking the questions on the surveys that were distributed, who was analyzing the data, who was in charge of making the policies, about how these things would run, who was going to get admitted to these schools and why and where they're going to come from, right? that all of those did not take into account the perspectives, right? the historical legacies of racism within this particular city and the things that had affected those students in that location. Right? And so white logic and whiteness as property are two concepts that are somewhat emergent from a critical race discourse. Um, we can talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A. But again, racially decontextualized. They're deficit oriented, right? That we only, so when I sort of raise these problems, right, to some extent, nobody was that surprised, right? We know and we hear often about students of color being at the bottom of our achievement indicators. But for some reason, that's all we want to study, right? At no point did people at this institution think, okay, well, we have a problem. But there's also this 15.4% that did graduate, there's also the 7.6% that did persist. What can we learn from them and the things that they were able to do to effectively navigate our institution? And how can we take those learnings and replicate systems that would actually enrich students' lives? And so this is what I mean by the deficit orientation and deficit thinking. And it's everywhere, right? Part of our uh, educational and social upbringings condition us to think about not only other people in these ways, but also ourselves in these ways, right? Internalization. And then lastly, thinking about all of this as what we call the architectural, the interpretational, and actionable property of white institutional actors. Okay, and again, we'll talk about that a little bit more in Q&A if you have specific questions. And then lastly, what we call the white overseers of a racially diverse university. Now, part of this is in uh, sort of a metaphorical way trying to draw connections between the idea of the institution and the university or the college as a plantation of sorts. Right? And we can get all into the like, nastiness of that, but I mean, we also know that, well, yeah, institutions were actually built on plantations by slaves. So it's not that far of a stretch, right? Uh, but in the same way, we see the replication and hierarchy of organizations in colleges and universities to be very much reflective of that. So despite the diversification of our institutions, despite that we are enrolling more students of color uh, in these spaces, we are not seeing that the faculty are represented of those students of color that administrators don't look like those particular students, that those perspectives are not in the highest rungs of our institutions, right? If you took a survey of just the university presidents in the state of Florida, how many of them are people of color? How many of them are women? How many of them are LGBTQ identified, right? And so in, again, in the same way in this particular instance that almost overwhelmingly the majority of the faculty were white, the majority of the institutional leadership were white, Despite changes in leadership, those cabinets are reconstructed in forms of whiteness. And again, this is in a 35 to 40% black city, right? So how does one expect to be representative in those conversations and in those rooms without those bodies being there, right? Now racial composition and representation is only part of that. 
right? We know that we got some black and brown faces in high places and they ain't really represent for us either. Right, Ben Carson? <laughs> right, Steve Harvey? I mean, you know, black men in general. Right? But we have this, right? We have people that are also subscribing to these same ways of thinking, these same ideologies, and are reproducing these same systems of oppression, even though they look like us. Right? So this ain't just a white folks thing. Right? We're definitely talking about white folks, too. But it's also about a way of thinking, right? an ideology, an orientation. So next, I want to talk about what this all has led to. Right? Student activism and institutional change. So you can imagine when these things are happening repetitively and consistently and historically on our campuses, right, there's no other choice but to, to rise up. And that's what we've seen from students since uh, 2015, particularly on campuses. But again, as I mentioned, organizations like the Dream Defenders and the Black Youth Project and a number of others have been doing this work for even more years than that. That we're seeing student organizations take up arms, figuratively speaking, to hold their institutions accountable for the things that they said they were supposed to do. Now, there's a brilliant book called Black Campus Movements by Ibram X. Kendi, formerly Ibram X. Rogers, a historian and professor at the University of Florida, uh, who wrote this book. And it beautifully lays out the important part of black student activism and what he calls the radical reconstitution of higher education. And so as uh, some of the older folks are maybe familiar in the room, the emergence of things like ethnic studies, right, African-American studies, um, and all these sort of race-based epistemologies were emerging because students said, we aren't learning about ourselves. That idea of curricular disregard that I brought up, Right? Students were going to the mat saying, we need to see ourselves in this space, and we need you to create something for us, and if not, we will create it for ourselves. Well, as history would have it, what do you think students are talking about still, right now? Right? So when we talk about student activism, these are the things that we see as a symptom of poor campus climate, a symptom of continuing to be disregarded, continuing to be considered disposable, and not having to be paid attention to. Why? Because again, we're on a four to six year scale, right? We'll just wait for them to like get out of here. There's some rabble rousers. We'll get some different folks in here. Well, that doesn't seem to be working out uh, too well. And so here you'll see a ton of news clippings, right? This is mostly from the fall of 15, some are from 2016, of uh, just instances of students making their voices heard. Now, the CERP freshman survey, which is administered by the uh, uh, Higher Education Research Institute at the University of Southern, uh, not Southern California, that's where I'm going, <laughs> University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Um, they do the survey every year. And so they're trying to get a sense of, you know, who's coming into college, how they think and feel about political issues, things of that nature. Uh, well, for the first time in 50 years, uh, we are at an all-time high, that 33% of college freshmen expect to uh, participate in a protest or a demonstration. Right? Now, this is also in the wake of like, the recent election year, so you can imagine that part of that is, is, is that conversation. This is a 50-year high. Right? In 50 years, we have not been this high in terms of students who thought that they would participate in some form or fashion um, in, in student protest. And what's more about this particular issue is that black students were the most likely to be participating in, this pro in these forms of protest and twice as likely as their white peers. Why do we think that is? Social media. Social media? That's good. Any others? Racism hasn't gone anywhere. Anti-blackness hasn't gone anywhere, right? And it's more prevalent and people are more aware and more in tune and attached to these things uh, than they used to be. And to the point of social media, a recent study that came out uh, that we actually just read for my class um, on Tuesday uh, made it clear that those that are uh, participating in some form of online activism, right, whether that's hashtagging or just you know, amplifying or signal boosting, are also involved in offline organizing, right? And so part of it is this dismissal of this idea that just participating on social media doesn't mean anything. Well, we know that like, social media is a reflection of life, right, and that you know, people can multitask and do multiple things. But that is actually a space in which people are not only making their voices heard, but a one, one sort of part of that in which they're also engaging with these other forms of protest. Just because we're a pen and we're some prestigious institution and wherever the hell we are, right, doesn't mean that we don't have to deal with these very real problems. Right? It doesn't mean that because we're steeping ourselves in this idea of prestige, which in and of itself, foundationally, right, is anti-black, that these things are happening. Now, the interesting thing about this case, and I don't know if any of you heard about what happened, uh, we had the entire black freshman class at Penn this year admitted to what the young people call a group me. So it's uh, interactive text technology where you can uh, have a group text outside of your regular text message stream. They were all added to a group me as well as to a group on Facebook. And then they were sent 
uh, what was called provocative, but I'll say downright racist and violent messages, pictures of black people being lynched, threats of them themselves being lynched, all within this digital technology. And so as we were just talking about the importance of technology in the roles of social change, that it's also a place in which racist violence also takes place. And I'm gonna give you another really wrinkle for, for what happened here. This didn't even happen at Penn. The origin of the group me was in the state of Oklahoma. So now a federal investigation had to be launched to understand how this happened because it's across state lines, so now it becomes a federal thing. So now we have to ask ourselves, how does somebody in Oklahoma, potentially, allegedly, get access to freshman phone numbers, freshman email addresses, to add them into a space to then enact violence? Now being at Penn, I mean, you know, we've got some pretty smart kids there. I mean, we've got kids that's net worth is way more than mine is. Uh, so then I had to ask myself too, well, I mean, we got a lot of engineers and programmers, and I don't know if you're into like watching Black Mirror or any of these other shows that have like a lot of hacker influence. Mr. Robot is like kind of my thing. But I asked myself, I said, well, couldn't they maybe design something that could redirect a signal to, or to originate in Oklahoma and actually be in Philadelphia? So I had to think, is this part of what we are incubating as an institution? More importantly, I had to think to myself, well, what are we teaching our students in order for these types of things to take place and happen. Now, to be completely fair, I mean, our greatest testament to this mishap and this miseducation of white America, as we would say, happens to just be the 45th president of the United States. Educated and graduated from Penn, said he was the top of his class, but he was like, you know, average student at Wharton. Um, but one has to think, right? Again, thinking historically. What did we do as an institution to ensure that our white students specifically have an understanding of what whiteness is, of what white privilege is, right? How did they get an understanding of centering people of color in conversations about people of color? Not something that are regulated to often all white spaces. How did they get interrogated about their social and educational upbringings so that we don't end up with more Donald Trumps? Right? Years apart. Same things taking place and same things happening. Because I can assure you that nobody at Wharton Business School you know, interrogated Donald Trump about his perspectives on women and whatever rights or ownerships he feels he has over their bodies didn't happen, right? Nor did anybody do that about the racist stereotypical assumptions he has about people of color. And seemingly we're not doing a very good job right now either. So this brings us to sort of the final part of our exercise here together is that we have to consider what are new visions for higher education. What does it mean to do this work differently? What does it mean to be in these spaces differently? So that we're not replicating the very things we say that we don't agree with. And so for me, this work emerges out of a discourse that is known as Afrofuturism. Uh, there's also Chicana futurism that has emerged in recent years. Um, but essentially, Afrofuturism is here to really reconcile the relationships of people of color and black folks specifically with narratives about technology, about humanism, and often to provide an alternative understanding of the future that centers black lives, that values black lives, and most importantly, puts black folks in charge of their own humanity. And so when I think about what visions for the future look like, I wonder what that means for the future of higher education, right? Something that has this racist storied past and seemingly continues to perpetuate that racism at every ebb and flow. So that's one part of this. I also build from the work of Robin D.G. Kelly, who's a really well-known historian, um, The Boston Review, which is a great publication you should check out if you get a chance. Um, it's very thoughtful in its analysis, but not always too academic-y, and it's not behind a paywall like most of our journal articles are, for whatever reason. Um, and so it emerges from this idea of uh, freedom dreams, and what they write uh, in the, opening introduction, the last paragraph, is that what it means to sort of dream and have this sense of radical imagination is essentially trying to envision the somewhere in advance of nowhere. It is an extremely difficult task, and yet is it a matter of great urgency. Because without new visions, we don't know what to build, only what to knock down. Y'all feeling me? Without new visions, without imagination, we only know what to knock down and not what to build. And so we only end up confused, rudderless, cynical. And so that we forget that making a revolution is not a series of clever maneuvers or tactics, 
but in fact a process that can and must transform us. And so when I think about these things in a conversation about the future of higher education, I have to give myself, and I'm giving you all as well, some future considerations. Now, as Kelly goes on to write, I can't give the answer, right, except and expect non-closure. I'm telling you right now, I don't have the future right here. But we do, right? And Kelly invites us all to be a part of that contribution of actually thinking about what a future looks like that's different than our present and that is different than our past. And so the considerations I ask uh, for us are these particular four. There are a number that we could also consider. So the first is that we fully recognize the symbiotic relationship of higher education and society. So one, that means that we recognize the proximity within which higher education functions as society, but that the relationship in and of itself is one that is mutually beneficial, right? School produces society, and society produces school, right? So then what are we actually producing if our institutions that are responsible for educating young people and educating continual, continuing adults are deeply invested in racial violence? Right? What does that mean? And so we have to recognize that, right? As much as what we're seeing here is something that's a function of broader society and vice versa. Again, what Trump is constructing in the form of his imagination and his society is very much indicative of what he experienced in his education at the University of Pennsylvania, right? There's a symbiotic and longstanding relationship. Two, we must divest from oppressive notions of meritocracy and institutional prestige. I think this is really, really important. And I think about that a lot as you know, I sit on admissions committees and have conversations about admissions, and the way that we sort of like rank order students in this very weird like way, because we want to be prestigious, right? And so part of the prestige at places like Penn is that selectivity is very, very low, right? Like, so we take a very small percentage of the applicants that apply to our school, and that makes us more prestigious, right? We're not prestigious based on who we admit, but who we turn away. What are we doing? Again, it seems that we as a nation are now becoming more prestigious, right? becoming more of a power, not by who we're letting into the country, who inevitably have always made this country better, but who we're keeping out. Because it just makes complete sense to bomb someone for bombing someone in their own country that we didn't let in the country in the first place. Right? Same sort of logic. We have to divest from that idea that it makes us more prestigious by not having certain people a part of a community particularly in the sense of higher education, because we know from a lot of the diversity literature that diversity has a learning outcome, right? We know that organizations are improved by diversity, right? And we reduce that sometimes to diversity of thought, but we don't think about the experiences and the bodies that those thoughts exist in, right? So again, we need to divest from these particular notions. Third, we have to reject market-driven behaviors, which we sort of call neoliberalism, broadly speaking, and the accumulation of capital through the exploitation of all labor. And so what do I mean by that? I'm talking about student athletes in Division I programs like my school, right? We released a report a couple of years ago and re-released a report last year about racial disparities in Division I college athletics. Well, we could see an institution, like I mentioned in the, in the Northwest, or in the Midwest, excuse me, with 10% black students enrollment, but then there's 60% of the football team and 80% of the basketball team. And then those students are also not graduating, right? We can see at places like the place at which I work currently and other institutions like us, right? Harvard recently had a big labor strike because they wouldn't pay a living wage to the people that worked in the facilities and in housing and in the dining halls. Harvard University, right? Their endowment's, what, 37 billion, something crazy? Right, so much so that institutions like ours don't actually have to charge tuition, but we do, and a lot of it. Right? So we're exploiting labor. Right? We're creating these margins. We're treating our institutions like businesses. And so we have to divest from that exploitation. And then fourth, we have to rededicate ourselves to engaging in the process of teaching and learning that provides students what W.B. Du Bois would call the means to live a life, in a full life. Right? I hear a lot about STEM education. There's a big push for STEM education. We've got to get on the STEM train. Well, there's some people who aren't going to be STEM majors. Even worse, there are people who will major in STEM like I did when I started out at Florida State as an aeronautical engineer, and I said, I don't like math and science that much. <laughs> but it only took me having a 1.9 GPA my first semester of freshman year, right, to realize maybe that's not what I should be doing, because I'm actually like a really good writer and a creative person. So maybe I should follow that passion. 
right? Because when we think about the humanities and we think about the arts, those are the things that make us feel more human. So it's not to say that that particular trajectory is bad for anybody, but what does it mean that we so narrowly define what students have to do in order to get through their particular coursework that doesn't involve becoming fuller human beings? Because I think that that's critically important to how we're thinking about reimagining the work that Phil's doing, right, as someone who's in charge of these types of things, the core curriculum, right? But again, also thinking about the way that students make sense of their positions of power, their positions of privilege, within these larger contexts in which they're going to find themselves, right? Our work in our particular division, which is the higher ed division of the Graduate School of Education, is that we're preparing people to come work at the University of South Florida, Sarasota, Manatee. We are preparing people to go to Cheney University in Pennsylvania. We are preparing people to go to universities and colleges all across the country to do very important student affairs and otherwise administrative work. So what does it mean for us to really teach these students to not think about their future students as full human beings, not pushing them to actualize themselves in ways that maybe their parents didn't say was the right path for them because college is so expensive and I'm not sending you there to write music and study art or take photographs, right? Or get lost during study abroad and never come back home. Right? But these are the experiences that make us who we are. These are the things that make us more human. And so I think that these are some general considerations as we're thinking about a pathway forward that hopefully we can engage in this Q&A about what that looks like, about how important our imagination as it once was when we were children can be to envisioning the future that we want for our children, for our children's children, and how we all are deeply invested in the things that will ensure that that does not happen. So with that, I thank you very much and I welcome questions. Okay, so I know what you want to do is go get yummy food. And what you don't want to do is have a microphone shoved in your face. But a conversation like this is completely incomplete if we don't have just that conversation. So I'm hoping that some of you will ask questions, provide commentary, criticism, and I will put this mic right in your face. Let me come over here first. I wanted to add to your list about how do you help the students that are entering college imagine, uh, because this is part of the problem. You mentioned 68% were first timers. Mm -hmm. When you go to college for the first time, you know, imagine again, a young girl going to college for the, going in, in 1964 entering college. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just, it's, you, you don't know what you're doing. It's, it takes that first semester to really kind of even get your feet on the ground. But, but in this day and age, there's an expectation that they'll already have this, this insight, and they don't. Mm -hmm. So how do you prepare students? That's one of the things that I saw. And then the second thing was, how come, why not be involved in solutions? We had an excellent, um, uh, comment, excellent um, Herald Tribune article on a sentencing. Mm -hmm. and how they discovered the bias in the sentencing. Mm -hmm. Why aren't we looking at being more involved in these kinds of things to bring that up for solutions? Yeah. So those are two things that I saw. Yeah, uh, great, great points. Um, so I think a part of the first semester conversation is really, really critical. Um, so to me, it's very interesting that upon your first footstep into college, depending on what your major is, you automatically have no choices, right? You have no choices in terms of which classes you take, when you take them, depending on which major you're on. If you're a student athlete, you have no sort of governance over your own time and how you spend that time. Um, and so I wonder if we think about the first semester uh, being something completely different, right? That it's maybe like um, an audit, like right? you can audit classes uh, that don't actually count necessarily in terms of grades. Um, could we think about people having an exploratory part of that first year, right? One of the things that's been really popular is this gap year idea. Okay, we can trouble through that. I mean, so it's been talked about, you know, Malia Obama's taking a gap year before she goes on to Harvard. And so we know that there are advantages of taking that year, right? Figuring certain things out and doing uh, what you can to be better aligned when you go to college. But part of that, too, is that it's steeped in certain le levels of privilege, right? Certain people can't take gap years. And we know often for students of color and low-income students, if they don't go right out of high school, they're less likely to go at all. So... so Yeah, and I think that some schools are doing that. The problem is that it's only happening at certain schools that have the privilege and resources to make those things happen, and it's not you know, trickling down in the way that we think that it should. So I think that that's um, one particular point. In terms of investing in solutions, I actually wrote like a scathing Facebook post of sorts. I mean, I do that a lot. I mean, you'll probably check my social media and be like, why the hell did they invite him here? But part of it was asking my colleagues, like, why the hell aren't we thinking about 
like things that we can do to actually solve some of these issues. Um, and so there are people that are working on that. I had the fortunate opportunity to do a documentary last year on the experiences of African Americans in education, and not only wrestling with some of the statistics that I shared that are very common, but also people that are doing amazing solution-based work, uh, some of which is right here in Florida, um, and what they're doing to sort of navigate some of these challenges. So there are people doing that work. It is being highlighted. Of course, we absolutely need more. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Next, I'm gonna come right over here. Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is twofold, but it's somewhat rhetorical. Mm -hmm. You might not be able to really answer it. Um, two things, how in your you know, education and travels, how could we recruit more um, minority faculty mm -hmm. and also minority students? Yeah, very, very important question. So I'll say this uh, sort of in two different ways, one of which is for sure gonna be controversial. So on the one hand, I think we need to be honest about what is available and offered to folks that we're trying to recruit here. And so a lot of what we see in our work is what we call climate-driven departure. All right, and what I mean by that is that we bring people to places, right, and this happens like all the time. It happens when we do orientation. It happens when we do uh, search committees, right? You bring diverse candidates or diverse students to campus, and what do you do? You get all the black folks, right, or all the Latino folks, and you bring them all together, and you do what you can to make sure that they see that you have diversity. And when you get to campus, again, maybe not so much this campus because it's like one you know, big building, but like you get to campus, or maybe even in the building, right, um, you get here and you're like, where, where did everybody go? Like I thought we had like a lot of, I was like, oh no, this person works in admissions, this person works in development, this is one sociology professor over here, there's one person in student government. And so we're not honest about that, right? We sort of do a bait and switch, right? And again, we don't necessarily know like, that that's not the thing to do. I'm saying don't do that. Don't do that. And so this segues into my next point of being honest and transparent about what's really going on. I think that's what I hear most from faculty in particular and staff, is that the bait and switch was something that's very disheartening, and then the experiences on top of that, we talked about these microaggressions, these little things, they continue to happen and people eventually leave. Um, and so I think being honest goes a really long way of letting people know what is available when they get here. Um, because again, these are things that you know, people of color in particular have been struggling with their entire lives, right? In some form or fashion. So it's not new, right? We just don't want you to lie about it, right? Don't try to sell me on this as like the most diverse place on earth and it's like, well, no, your iPads data says that it's actually 70% white in terms of student enrollment. But I only saw like 100% of black and brown folks when I came for orientation, right? And again, we can figure these things out. So I think that that's part of it. I think we also have to be honest about the ways in which we compensate labor and professionally. Um, we have to stop thinking about this idea of compensating diverse talent um, in certain types of ways um, as preferential treatment, right? I had a college level vice president of a research one institution tell me that giving uh, additional incentive to get a diverse faculty was preferential treatment. He said it was affirmative action. And I'm saying, well, you want somebody to move into the, like, the Midwest, this isn't the same city, because that was like a major city in America. This was like a Midwest town. It's like, you want, like a 29, 32 year old straight out of their doctoral program, right, who has like their whole lives ahead of them to come to like this particular place to teach at this particular school with no incentives, right? Much less like the communal and cultural incentives. Um, and the thing that made that even much worse is that they had a pool of money to do this and they were instructing deans and department chairs not to offer the money, but that in fact they should make a, just a general offer and if that person says no, then you can offer them the extra money. Right, and so we're pinching pennies in these particular ways, but when we see that there's like a new stadium being built, right, or that you know we see what like our chancellor or our president is making, right, University of Arizona where I did my doctoral work, our president, uh, who came from Temple previously, was getting paid. I don't, she gets paid like some obscene amount of money, but was also getting paid $120,000 from DeVry University, right, and then we're saying, well, we don't have money to support undocumented students who don't have access to federal financial aid. It's like, but you've got like over half a million dollars you're getting annually and we're paying for that, right? Taxpayers are paying for that. I mean, it's also Arizona, so let's be honest, right? Like second to maybe one or two other states. I mean, Floridians were not that great either at this stuff. Uh, but these are the types of things that people are doing, right? And it's pushing people out and it's making people not want to go to these places that really need them to be there.
you kind of touched a little bit on my question, but um, as we kind of expand these efforts for diversity, a big danger and trap that we fall into, and we've even been guilty of it here and other places that I've worked at, is um, tokenism and utilizing yeah. students for photo shoots or to be, like you said, ambassadors. And you know, when you are trying, obviously, to be more diverse and you are using these students to help be ambassadors, you want to utilize them and they want to talk to students and they want to tell their story, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you don't want them to become like you said, the person of color yep. that is representing the woman, that is the woman engineer, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of um, issue. And how would you combat that? Because we are a small school, we're growing, yeah. but we do have a limited number that we thankfully are growing. But what do you do when you don't have the resources? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. I'm not gonna say that it isn't, right? Um, but I think that when it comes to the burden that it is to bear for the institution, uh, that you have to deal with that. You have to struggle with that in the same way we have to struggle with being tokenized and being alone and being hyper-visible and invisible at the same damn time, as the young people say. Um, and so in doing that, part of it is, again, transparency, right? Um, it's saying that we're not gonna exploit the fact that you, know, you are a chair student leader who's in seven different organizations and you know, giving tours and like working at the library and doing all kinds of other stuff. We're not gonna exploit that. We're gonna honor and recognize that as a very real thing and to say that we actually need to not do that to you. We don't need to have what we call uh, in the literature cultural taxation, right? Because this is what happens. We, over, um, we have an over-reliance on the, on the maximum amount of production of the minimal amount of people. And so this is what I was talking about in terms of incentives, right? We bring a faculty person of color or a staff person of color, and we don't think about all the extra work they'll have to do as someone who's there as a token, right? Like, I advise people that aren't my students because they see me on campus and they say, that's a black professor. Like, we're in a graduate school. I advise undergrads. Julie's in my office all the time, right? I'm not in his major or anything. So I'm doing all of this sort of unpaid, uncompensated labor because of like, you know, the genuineness of my heart, being invested in education. But like my white colleagues don't have to do that, right? And I'm not even standing faculty at GSE at this particular point. I'm like, I'm a lecturer, which is basically an adjunct, right? And so even on top of that, right, I'm not seeing other people who are doing less work but getting paid more in the same sort of way. So again, I think it's a double-edged sword. I think transparency and being honest about that, actually negotiating with a person before you ask them to do something, right, saying, hey, would you be interested in doing this? Are you comfortable with this? How could this be uh, more efficient for your use of time? All of these different co-constructions that we could create that we don't, right? We just sit there and say, hey, Charles, I need you to be on this committee. Like, did you just, could you ask me maybe if I wanted to do that? Like, I'm also on four other committees because we have no diversity representation. So I think that's part of it. Transparency, co-construction are all really important. And also just like figuring out a different way, right? Like if, if the issue is that we need diverse representation, it's not my individual problem, it's not your individual problem to solve. That's the institution's problem to solve. So, right, so we're gonna push it back to you and saying, yeah, I'm not here to be a representative, I'm not going to be a representative. And I've experienced this personally in a number of ways. So sometimes you have to just not ask. And again, that's part of being honest. Don't have a brochure where it's like one white student, one Latina student, one Southeast Asian student, and one black student, when that's not even how your student body is composed. Get 10 students, make seven of them white, make three of them people of color, and just be transparent. And honor that in the publication itself. Actually speak to it, right? We don't do that. We try to paint the rosy picture. We use infographics now so we can just make people all kinds of different colors, right? We do all kinds of stuff. I get it, I get it. Um. I have a, uh, so many thoughts that are going through my head. Uh, I came here because I don't think a lot of the way that you think. I'm probably the only Trump voter in the entire room. In Sarasota? Duh, in Sarasota. Yeah. But I wanna understand. I do wanna understand which is why I came. So sometimes I like to look at what's the root cause. Mm -hmm. So as she said, start in junior high. I think it goes way back before that. If you start in junior high, it's probably too late. Sure. If you, you have to start when, I think, in the family root, the family unit. And it's how these kids are growing up. Are they growing up in two family households? And sometimes you can't help it, but it's become accepted that you don't have to be in a two family household. Is education important? When, you know, I've never been black. I've been Jewish my whole life. When I went to college, they were looking for my horns. When my grandfather went to school, they beat him up on the way to school. But the family unit was, it doesn't matter what they do to you if, it, if you don't internalize it and you do what you need to do for yourself. Mm -hmm. So when I would question him, what did you do when they beat you up? I did my work. I went to school. We had a family. 
we, we scrimped and saved so my, so my father and my aunt can go to college. Mm -hmm. What did I do when I was in sales in the early 80s, the only woman on Wall Street, and I got all sorts of things said to me. I, I just buckled down and made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So you can let things roll off your back or you can become a victim. And I know, I, I, I can't imagine because I don't look black, I might not look Jewish, so people, I can go by, I can do things. So I can never understand that piece of it. But some of it psychologically says to me, if you're always thinking badly, if I'm always a victim, psychologically, what does that do? Does it let you get through that next hurdle of I can do this myself? So just a comment. Yeah, so I'll respond in brief. Um, I mean, a lot of what's entangled in that type of rhetoric in and of itself, like holds beholden things that people of color have never had access to. Um, and so we think about the family unit, right? Well, one, how are we defining family? What constitutes a family, right? If we think about uh, you know, the strengths of black families or from a strengths and an asset-based approach perspective, it's like, yeah, I may not have two parents in the household, partially because you're taking away black men during the Vietnam War and they're on the front lines being killed off, not that there aren't also white veterans, right? But that there's also this military industrial complex that's coming into places that look like me and taking people like me out of this space. Right? We have the um, you know, mass incarceration that's also happening that's taking black men and women right, out of spaces to decentralize the family. But there's also a village. Right? There's also aunties and uncles. Right? Like I got at least three aunties in here just by default. And so we have that too because on that block right, we have some qualitative differences in the way it looks in terms of constitution, but we've got people there that care about us and that love us. Regardless of whether we have a male and female in the household, we have two women, we have two men, whatever the case may be. Um, so I think we have to, one, restructure how we think about the importance of family and what family can contribute, and then what types of stresses that family is under, right? Where it's like, no, certain mothers and certain fathers can't be at home doing homework with their kids because they work three jobs. And they have to work three jobs because they're in, like, wage slavery, right? And so we have to interrogate all of these sort of assumptions we make about things that lead to certain types of outcomes that ultimately are not completely accessible to all kinds of people. And I think you spoke to that on sort of both ends in the sense of, in some ways, yes, you have ways that you and your family historically have been disenfranchised, but there's also a way in which uh, Jewish folks within this country have also been able to access whiteness, right? That gives you a pathway to do certain things that other people can't. So in the same way that, you know, this idea, I mean, we can talk about like the Women's March, for example, and the perspectives on the Women's March, um, and something that my students are interrogating is that, well, yeah, when we talk about like women and we reduce that to only meaning certain types of women and not the fullness of what that could encompass, right? Racially, gender, otherwise. Um, we, have to, we have to talk about that in an honest way that yes, as a woman on Wall Street, for example, you certainly were one of few there. You buckled down and did what you needed to do. But were, how many women of color were also there with you? And what pathways were, were it for them to get into those spaces, right? Were they even allowed into business schools in some instances? Right, so I think we just have to always interrogate the ways that we're thinking, and there's so many resources available uh, to be able to work through and talk through some of that, and I'm sure that we can talk more after. We've got time for two more questions. Did so I get still hold yours for outside conversations, but I'm gonna go right here, and if you could just. Um, thank you for the talk, but one of the things that I impressed, I was very impressed by what you said about how we imagine the space, and all the conversations or all the comments I've heard is, well, this is the subordinate group, how do we move it up? But if you look at it in terms of when we deny opportunity to even one person or any of this, the small group or the large group, the, this, we could have a cancer cure from these people. Mm -hmm. We all benefit when um, we provide opportunities to everyone. And when we're saying, oh, this is the group that needs to pull itself up in some way. And when we say, oh, what kind of family did it, was, was the child raised in? The point is, every family is dysfunctional and functional in one, some way or the other. Can we snap for that? <laughs> and when We've we, all been to family reunions, come on. And, you know, and when we have the paradigm, oh, the, the, the parent wasn't there, so what? That mother or that aunt or whoever it was, doesn't matter where the child gets the love and the support. What matters is the child get the love and support. It shouldn't be where it came from when you said about, well, it's the village that do it. When we begin to imagine that from this group that didn't get the higher education, 
we have denied X number of cancer cures, X number of people who could be providing energy to the source, that way of thinking will only change the bigger picture. Otherwise, it is always this little thing we are changing, and it's not the structural change that we are doing. As long as we do the bigger picture structural change, I think then only can we imagine a better future for everyone. Yeah, so not only are we limiting, right, it's also erasure, right? We erase the, the people that come from these spaces that have made these contributions. So I'm like immediately thinking about the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. Right, um, and so you can Google it. There's like a trailer of it, but um, but Henrietta Lacks is a black woman that the NIH exploited her genes in order to find like a number of different cures for things. Completely erase her from history, right? Now this is also a different conversation in the context of when we think about white supremacy, right, and sort of like genetic hierarchies, right? I mean, Steve Bannon has said like oh so many different things about that. But then you think about like the actual discoveries and things that have been made from the cells of a black woman who was like basically ceased to exist to the majority of the world. Um, and so I think that that's important too, that it's also an, an exercise of white supremacy in these ways to engage in erasure. Um, I think what you also sort of mentioned um, was this idea of like needing to ascend to a particular place. And so when I think about imagination, this is what I mean. I mean that we're no longer saying that what we need is to have simply more seats at the table of the powerful. We actually need to reconstitute relationships of power within society because it's not going to do us any good if we still abide by certain forms of power and domination of which we are now the head. Right? And so this is partly why like, intersectionality is so important as we think about liberation and freedom for black and brown people. And this is why like, men of color particularly get critiqued and rightfully so because they see themselves as simply swapping places with white men. Well, that ain't going to do it. Right? That's not what we need. And so we have to think about a way of decentralizing and destabilizing structures of power, relationships of power, in order to actually reimagine anything, because otherwise it's just a different permutation and a different iteration of what we've already seen. Right? We see this uh, in the sense of like, how American imperialism works. Right? As much as like, us as black folks and other brown folks want to like, herald that we had Barack Obama, Barack Obama was bombing the hell out of Syria long before Trump was doing that. He was deporting and separating families more so than any president prior to him. Right? Now this doesn't necessarily mean a specific individual personal indictment, but it does mean that if we just simply secede and take ownership of existing forms of power, existing forms of domination, that we're simply driving the vehicle. Okay. Would you take two more questions? I, we'll, I keep them, we'll keep them moving. I'm stay. Hi, I'm so Hi. glad I made it. This Thank was you for coming. Uh, unbelievable. I just want to make a comment out of my own experience of working with an organization mm -hmm. that provides college prep for low-income first-generation, primarily Latino students. I think the value of looking at the family is really key because we are um, doing some multicultural, multi-generational work. Mm -hmm. We are trying to change the framework. There are so many families that have never seen anyone going to college. Mm -hmm. They don't even have an idea what it entails. Yeah. And so how are they going to uh, foster that um, culture of college going in their children? By bringing them to the table, giving them access to some of the workshops that we provide, taking them on a college tour, the parents are starting to think about mm -hmm. why it's important to foster education from a very early age. So luckily, that thinking is taking us to work with parents and children from a very early age. We are now starting in elementary school, middle school, and going into high school. Mm -hmm. It has to start early on. But I think that the value of the community partnerships is key. The college with community agencies like the one I work with, mm -hmm. and also the churches, and any other entity that is promoting youth development, child development, have to be at the table. Yeah, yeah. So this is about access, right? Like essentially, um, when we think about the imagination, right? Our imagination is often expanded by experiences. For many of us, that was like introductions to literature, uh, being able to like access ideas that were imagined by someone else that we can then conceptualize. And so in this instance, that's exactly right. If the institution only stays within the institution and doesn't go out and engage with the community, those folks will never have access to a space like this, even envision themselves here. And we know that pre-college socialization is a really important part of getting access. Just know that I could be in college, right? And so as I go back to that example, um, one, people in that area, uh, and something I didn't mention, many of the students who ended up applying um, in this contingents that we were talking about, they applied, I think like around like July 25th and got accepted in like August 4th or something like that. 
partly because one, they didn't necessarily know the institution was there, or they thought it was this one building, or they had ended up getting rejected from other schools. And so you can imagine the frustrations and challenges of not even being able to understand what's accessible to them in the immediate space, having to make this knee-jerk reaction just to get in somewhere, and then stumbling through the entire process. Uh, but there could have been better and more intentional outreach exercises similar to like the community partnership that you mentioned. Um, so that's really, really important. And when it comes to the early intervention, um, when we think about this idea of the achievement gap, and I put that in quotes intentionally because what it becomes is actually like a resource gap that then leads to a skills gap uh, rather than achievement, is that we know that as early as three years old, right, a, a child's trajectory can already be charted based on where they are for literacy. Right? We also know that the reading scores in third grade are used as predictors to open up prisons, right? Florida is like one of the biggest you know, perpetuators of that. We're doing it in Philadelphia and in the state of Pennsylvania as well, right? So then we have to say, well, what are we invested in, right? We have privatized the prisons. We have allowed people to make money off the exploitation of prison labor. And we're using the third grade reading scores of black and Latino youth to decide how many prisons we're gonna build and how many beds we're gonna have in them instead of saying, we could actually invest those dollars into literacy programs that would ensure that they don't become incarcerated. But we don't do that, right? Because we're, again, we're invested in these things that are about making money and amassing wealth. I'll be brief, which is hard for me to do, but I'm going to promise. Take your time. Um, I'm very interested in further dialogue in the future, should you come back, on the disparity along the K higher ed continuum mm -hmm. in education. Because for me, what I have seen is that you have inner city, urban, suburban education along K-12, and then you have your HBCUs, mm -hmm. private institutions, and your state universities, all that have various missions. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about all of our education that we have with all of these diverse learning systems we're supposed to have equal equity, access, and equality in America mm -hmm. so that we can assimilate and move into a society from our collegiate or career experience, says into a society where we were educated mm -hmm. in a disenfranchised and disfragmented system. So to me, it's a little bit complex. Mm -hmm. Um, because I do believe I'm an arts integration coordinator. I believe in the value of creativity, imagination, and innovation and learning. And I can tell I, by your beautiful outfit. It, <laughs> and have since I was in my mother's womb. But I do think that it is important for us to understand the various systems of education mm -hmm. and how we still, despite of knowing that there is racism, sexism, genderism, and lack of understanding of our multiple complexities mm -hmm. as we try to educate within yeah. this United States of America. Yeah. yeah, and that's why it's gonna take a community, right? That's why like no one individual person here will have the answers, but we have to be in conversation with one another about that. I think the interesting piece about how we think about education, at least in one context, and education related to labor, is that wrapped within this idea that we have to teach young people to value education, we simultaneously devalue labor. Right now, I know I'm not the only one, and this is across generations, I think, where your parents at some point intervened, right? You got some bad report card, and they asked you, do you want to work at McDonald's? Right? And you were like, well, hell no, I don't want to work at McDonald's. And so it was like, well, you need to go to college. Well, to be completely fair, at this point, there are many people who have went to college, got degrees, and also working at McDonald's. But what it does is it says that we think that education, right, um, is a way to really get access to an elite form of life that doesn't then put you in a different position without even having to analyze the systems that are at play in order for those folks to not have access that ends up, again, putting people in those positions. So we will simultaneously raise on high this value of education then devalue the labor, right? For those, for those of us that work at these institutions, how many names of the people who work the grounds and work in the facilities do we know? Do we even say hello? Do we thank them for the work that they're doing, right? Because often we don't think about that. But it's all built into this educational experiment that we're undertaking. So I think that that's important too. As much as we want to see the importance of education, again, what does that mean to be a full human being? And part of being a full human being is empathy, right? It's compassion, 
right? And these are things that we can't learn in a lot of our classrooms based on the curricula that we have, K-12 or higher ed. I would argue that almost as you get higher in, you get less of that. Um, but that's an important consideration as we move forward. So. Okay, so it's clear that there are, there's a lot of imagination, there's a lot of ideas in this room, no two alike. So the best thing you can possibly do is go outside, have some food, and talk about those with somebody who is not like you. That's what this event is designed to do. So I wanna thank all of you for coming. Um, what a great conversation. Will you join me in giving one final round of applause? Yes. Thank you. So take your time, please go outside, and please eat food sponsored by the Multicultural Affairs Committee. It's yummy, it's out there.